Hello, my name is Mrs Forrest and I work at FRAM in the Achievement Centre. The Achievement Centre is one of the places you might come to if you need a little bit of support with settling in or with your learning. And all the adults who work in the Achievement Centre really want you to achieve well at FRAM and we're here to help you. Things are a bit different this year and you maybe haven't had the chance to visit FRAM in the way that you might have done if schools were operating normally. You should have received a welcome gift from us though. And your gift will include two books. One of them is a booklet called Voyages. So where's a voyage? Well, it's a long journey, often made by sea. And Voyages is a lovely story about two children who are about to start their first day at Fram. One of the characters in the story, Amira, has travelled to the UK by sea, whereas the other character in the story, Kai, hasn't travelled nearly as far. At the beginning of the booklet, it tells you who wrote the story, it was written by Dr Smith, who was one of the amazing English teachers here at Fram, along with a group of our incredible Year 7 students. I think they've done an amazing job. Do have a look at those first couple of pages, because it tells you a lot about how the story was put together. We know that while it could be an exciting starting a new school, it can also be scary. All of a sudden you go from being the oldest pupils in the school to being the youngest again. And you don't have your mum or dad to hold your hand like you did when you started reception. Well, I know a bit about how that feels because I just started at Fram last year, so I'm still fairly new as well. The other thing is, I'd never worked in a high school before either. I'd only ever worked in primary schools. So when I started at Fram, it felt huge. So if you're worried about getting lost, I know how you feel. I still don't properly know my way around and I have to ask the students to show me the way, just like you will at first. But the good news is no one sent me to the wrong place yet. And when they were writing the book, the Year 7s wanted the characters to face all of the things that new students find worrying. Making new friends, feeling left out, getting lost, meeting new teachers, building resilience, developing organisational skills and making mistakes. So let's meet the characters then. Make me a little bit smaller that we can focus on the characters Amira and Kai and let's find out what happened on their first day at Fram. The ship's horn blared on the distant horizon as the waves crashed aggressively against the side of the dinghy. We were lost at sea, our dinghy slowly deflating and sinking deeper, no matter how swiftly we used our buckets to tip the salty seawater back out. Large forks of lightning raced through the fog, seeming to strike into the depths of the desolate, abysmal waves. I tried to remember the luminous moon glistening and shining somewhere in the darkness, but hope was so lowly slipping through my fingers. The colossal ship loomed out of the mist, its horn still blaring mindlessly into the vast blackness of the night, and we were forced to stop our venture across the English Channel. My father's eyes opened wide with the sudden realisation there was no possibility of escaping now. Our only chance was that this ship would be our saviour and carry us to our destination. England. Paradise. Freedom. Safety. But the horn blared on. Someone was shaking my shoulder. Amira, wake up. It's the first day of school. You don't want to be late. I understood. The horn was my alarm clock. And today I started secondary school. As I opened my eyes, the memories gradually flooded back. The ship had fished us out of the water and I was so nervous I could hardly move. They had given us dry clothes and blankets and something hot to drink that I hadn't tasted before. They asked us lots of questions about our journey, but I didn't really understand because the way they spoke English was so different from what we had learned from American TV. My father held on to my hand very tightly. If we were separated, I don't know what we would have done. Father told them in English that we'd travelled from Syria, that we were educated and he was trained as a doctor, that we could be useful in England, that we were only looking for a safe place to live. We wanted only to work, support ourselves and be safe. We had tracked through shattered cities and across the desolate wilderness to reach the English Channel where we had given our entire life savings to a tall Englishman in a black hoodie. 
he told us he would take us across the water, that it was completely safe and we would be welcomed when we arrived. So desperate were we to believe that we had a chance of freedom, that we had trusted this man. It was only when we stepped into the dinghy that we realised we'd been robbed and betrayed. But it wasn't far to England, Father said, and we were strong enough to make it, even in a leaking dinghy. As my father explained our situation to these men, I let my eyes wander around the ship. The walls were made of metal. In fact, everything seemed to be made purely of metal. I wondered if it were a prison or a coast guard ship. My head started pounding and I couldn't think straight. Where were we? What had happened? The loud voices grew fainter and I realised that I was lying almost unconscious on the floor and they were looking at me. I must have fainted. My illness was so bad that I don't remember much of what happened over the next few weeks. I'd been strong enough to survive the long trek across Europe, the half-cooked food, the dirty drinking water, the fear of sitting in a sinking dinghy in utter darkness. But I had been strong enough to cope with being rescued. My father has remained silent about what happened during that traumatic time. Every time I ask him about it, he just shrugged his shoulders and sighed. All I know is that one day I woke up in an immaculately clean bed in the corner of the small flat. For once, there were no noises coming from outside. Father said the place was called Durham. He said he had found some work and that I could go to school now. He had smiled for the first time in months and a wave of happiness took over my mind. Chapter 2, Kai after what felt like the 50th buzz from my new alarm clock, I swung my arm round towards it and swept it off my dressing table. It tumbled to the floor with a giant crash, finally coming to rest among the pile of comic books that were strewn across the carpet. But my attempt to quell its piercing sound had been futile. It kept up the shrill buzzing that was summoning me to secondary school. The noise seemed to be getting louder and louder, drilling a hole through my head. I gathered up the energy to scramble out of bed after it, finding the button that would silence the horrendous sound. I considered throwing it out of the window, but quickly thought better of it. Best birthday present ever, not. Mum had given it to me to help me be prepared for secondary school. She kept saying the words independent, resilient, organised. And now apparently these words applied to me. What a joke! How on earth was I going to manage going to 10 different subjects, remember everybody's names, organise my homework, join sports teams, pack my school bag myself, fight my way through the dinner queue? When I went on a visit in July with my mates, the buildings were daunting, at least three times the size of my primary school. I felt woozy looking at all the staircases and corridors stretching every which way you turned, leading to classroom after classroom. I must have met about 15 teachers on the transition day, and that was only a few of them. How many hundreds of names would I have to remember? And what would happen when? Because it would be when, not if. I got lost. Mum's piece of advice number one. When you start to feel stressed, shift your focus to something else. So I looked up and saw my school uniform hanging on the outside of the wardrobe. Its grey material and red striped tie were different from what I'd worn to primary school. I dreamed of the old days when I only had to wear a polo shirt. Oh, how I longed to dig it out and wear it again. It would be so much easier than struggling to squeeze my arms into a proper smart shirt with its rigid collar and grown-up tie. The sheer thought of doing up the top button made me feel incredibly nauseous. Kai's piece of advice number one. When you start to feel stressed about your new school, don't look at your new school uniform. I'll be honest with you, though. That's mum's piece of advice number two, by the way. Honesty is the best policy. The worst thing about going to secondary school is my dyslexia. Dyslexia is when you struggle with your reading and writing, not because you haven't worked hard at it, but because of something in your brain that puts the letters in the wrong order. And it can be difficult to write your ideas down quickly. Doesn't mean I'm stupid. It just means that I need more time and sometimes more help. In fact, people with dyslexia can be brilliant at practical things like technology and art. 
Mrs Wilson, my year six teacher, knew that and she always knew what to do to help me without making me feel embarrassed. But what my new teachers know, would I have to tell them all? Would I have to tell my friends? The terrifying thought of having to tell, as I calculated, at least 20 people made my mouth dry as sand and my stomach tie itself into a knot. What would people think of me? It was all too much for me to handle. And so I pulled my duvet down over me as I lay on the soft grey carpet, my face pressed against the latest copy of Spider-Man. I thought maybe if I'm quiet, she'll forget. Maybe if I'm quiet, I can stay here all day and postpone my first day at school until some other time. As I heard her slippered feet climb the stairs, I held my breath, hardly daring to inhale. I heard her reach the top and turn to face my room. In fact, she was standing just outside it. There was always the possibility that she was just going to brush her teeth. She was silent. I was silent. I held my breath and the silence seemed to go on forever. Then it came, the tapping at the door. <coughs> Kai, are you getting up? You don't want to be late. It's your first day at secondary, remember? How could I forget? There's a bacon sandwich on the table for you. Come down before it gets cold. Well, at least that was something. Chapter three, Amira. As I shouldered my new red rucksack, the weight of its contents matched the weight of my fears. Its heaviness dropped on my shoulders, knocking me into reality. This was it, the day I would have to face my worries. As I walked towards the front door, a shiver shot down my spine and I felt myself trembling. I was a baby learning its first steps. Embarrassed about being anxious, I didn't want Dad to walk me to the school, so we decided to practice several times in the week running up to the big day, tracing the steps together, first him leading, then me taking charge. I'd thought about how much I missed the familiar streets of home. England was so bland. Everywhere I looked, everything seemed the same. Lifeless brick house after brick house, Pitch black tarmac pavement following on from monotonous grey concrete paving slabs. Where were the smells and sounds of busyness and life? I remember going to the bustling market at home, all of the people and the colours and the smells. But I forced that memory back into the dark recesses of my brain. Better to focus on the present than the past. I could walk the way to school with my eyes closed, and now it was time to go. I opened the front door and stepped out onto the street. It was only a few minutes walk to the school and as I got closer I started to see more grey clad bodies bouncing nervously along the pavement. Some were alone, some in clumps, some with a parent. Almost every one of us was silent with nerves. Our shared anxiety seemed to make an electric force field in the air, repelling all laughter and conversation. Then there was the huge green fence towering over me, tall strips of metal reaching up to the sky. Someone in a fluorescent yellow jacket stood next to the gate, enthusiastically welcoming each one of us as we went in. Silently, I nodded back. The winding path curled through some trees whose branches swooshed gently in the breeze. The grey gravel of the yard spread out in front of me. I hadn't realised that I wasn't crying until it was too late. Tears started streaming uncontrollably out of my eyes, an endless waterfall of nerves. The dread and despair that, I, that had been building up over the last few days suddenly opened and a black hole inside of me. I knew I should stay strong, but I just couldn't manage it anymore. I turned and ran. I'm very good at running. And so I ran and ran, my eyes fogged with tears and my heart pounding with panic. The next thing I knew, I hit something. The impact threw me to the ground and the whole world seemed to take a step out of time. Stop. Breathe. Count to ten. I was lying on the floor amongst rubble, listening to my father's ragged sobs. We had to get out of there. We had to be strong. I took his hand and told him it would be OK. I opened my eyes. The world slipped back into time and the teacher in the fluorescent jacket was peering over me, over me and a pair of skinny legs sticking out of a bush beside the path. 
The legs waved and kicked wildly in the drizzle. My first day at school was going horribly, horribly wrong. Chapter four, Kai. Sitting in the safety and security of my own kitchen, I finished my bacon sandwich and then munched through a bowl of cereal. I poured out the biggest amount of Cheerios I thought mum would allow, and I was eating as slowly as I could, without her noticing that I was wasting time. Goose, my pet cat, lay curled upon the sofa, purring and looking at me lazily through his green, sparkling eyes. He knew something was up. He knew that after a summer of games together, I'd soon abandon him. He licked his lips malevolently. Wishing that I could curl up beside Goose, I did as directed by Mum and ticked off the items on my checklist. Pencil? Yes. Pen? Yes. Ruler? Yes. Calculator? Yes. Lunch money? Yes. Notebook? Just in case, Mum had said. Yes. Holiday homework? Mm, completed last night. Yes. House keys? Yes. Returning the list to the magnet sprinkled fridge door, I wearily mumbled answers to my mum's questions. Yes, I have everything. Yes, I'm sure. Yes, I will turn my phone off before I go to a lesson. Yes, I have my dinner money. No, I'm sure I want to walk on my own. Yes, I'm going to make lots of new friends when I get there. Miss Lawrence had said the whole first week would be about making friends. The one thing mum didn't know was that I'd be taking a bit of extra help to school today. I'd slip my chubby-cheeked brown and white guinea pig bubble into my blazer, blazer pocket. I'd added a few Oreos and vegetables so that he wouldn't get hungry. Mm. Bubble knew all of my secrets. And he would be there for me during the day. Best not to let Mum know, though. She probably wouldn't think it was a good idea. Mum said, it's ten past eight, you better go. I heaved a sigh. Oh, it's actually eight minutes past. Every minute counted to me. She laughed and called me pedantic, like she always does, ruffling my hair and handing me my blazer. With one last heartfelt mumble, I hurried out of the front door and into the fresh autumn air. I was already running late. In the distance at the end of the twisting street, I could see a clump of kids from my primary school class shuffling along in a huddle. Did I mind that I wasn't one of them? Absolutely. Was I going to show that I minded? Absolutely not. Time for mum's piece of advice number three. Don't worry about what other people think about you. It's what we think of you that matters. Time for Kai's piece of advice number three. Say yes to your mum and don't cry. Crossing the road, I ran quickly down the other side, listening to my footsteps echoing. That was my greatest skill, sprinting. I'd won every running race all the way through primary. And I'm on the county team. Running makes me feel free. As I concentrate on every step, I feel the warm breeze sweeping my anxieties away. I'm able to ignore the outside world. Across the road, I could see the school's green fence with the branches of trees sticking through. As I passed the other year seven students, I noticed that turning into this road was like walking through an invisible barrier. They all felt silent. Without a word, they walked along the fence and approached the gate. A teacher in a fluorescent yellow jacket stood there greeting the students as they entered and telling them where to go. I think it was Miss Lawrence. I'd seen her at the transition day back in July. Panic gripped my whole body and I acted like I didn't care. But really I did. I just wanted to isolate myself from everything and everyone, preferably somewhere I could lose myself in the world of comic books. So I sprinted as fast as I could past the teacher, ignoring her shouting, You don't need to run! Slow down! Where are you going? Then everything happened very quickly. I was aware of a small girl with a tear-stained face sprinting the other way at full speed. I was aware that she wasn't looking where she was going and that I was running too fast to change direction. I was aware that, like me, she was very good at running. I heard my feet slapping against the concrete path. I heard my breath in my lungs. I felt the blood pounding in my ears. I felt my school bag bouncing on my back as I took another step. And I felt the impact of her shoulder as she flew into me. The next moment, our combined momentum propelled me sideways. And I saw the prickly branches of a bush travelling very quickly towards my face. I desperately hoped that bubble would be OK in my pocket. My nerves were quaking and my heart was pumping while my whole body shivered with surprise. 
the force of the impact had knocked me into oblivion. OK, so maybe I'm exaggerating, but it definitely knocked me into a bush and I ended up with my feet flapping helplessly in the air. What an entrance to my new school. Kai's piece of advice number four. Don't run into a sprinting, crying girl on the first day of school. You've probably guessed who Kai's bumped into. Talk about making an entrance. I'm going to leave the story there for today. Join me again soon to find out whether Amira and Kai's day gets any better. Surely it can't get any worse. See you soon.